Well, our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. So if you'd like to turn there, Matthew 14, 22 through 33, it's found, it's found on page uh, 1042 in your pew Bible. While you're turning there, let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for the word that you've given to us. Again, we thank you that you've preserved it exactly as you want it. We thank you we can rely on it as absolute truth. Uh, we can learn from it. We can make it a part of our life. And Lord, we thank you that we can hear from you through these words. And so we ask, Lord, that we would hear from you today as we read. And as Josh gives us our message today, we pray that you would just use him, Father, to, to give us the message that you want us to hear. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the, on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, Is it a ghost? And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But, he saw that, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. Josh, welcome. Well, good morning, church. It is very, very good to be with you this morning. My name is Josh. I hail from Everett, Washington. I'm the pastor of Port Gardner Community Church there on the dark side of the state. <laughs> but I feel like we've had some, some, some synergism during 2020, though. We've had, we've had some relation repairing across the mountains, right? You gave us the worst air quality in the world for about a month, and we gave you COVID restrictions. So you are welcome. <laughs> you had my dad a couple weeks ago, so you get Craig Loftus light this morning. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we are a broken people in need of your grace every second of every day. Father, you have saved us, you have redeemed us, you have called us your own through the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that as we dive into your word this morning and we read what you would have us read, that you will cause our hearts to receive, our ears to hear, our minds to understand. And I pray that what my brothers and sisters hear of me this morning is absolutely nothing of me at all and all of you through your spirit. We pray this in the name of our great and loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have not turned there yet, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew. As Elder Dave said, we will be in chapter 14, verses 21 through 33. By means of an introduction... Uh, I'd like to introduce to you a man whose name most or not all of you will probably recognize. His name is Horatio Spafford. And in 1871, Horatio Spafford, a prosperous lawyer and devout Christian, and his wife Anna were living comfortably with their four young daughters in Lakeview, Chicago. In that year, the great Chicago fire broke out, which devastated the entire city. For the next two years, Horatio and Anna devoted their time to welfare, 
amongst the refugees of the fire. By November of 1873, the Horatio Spafford, excuse me, the the Spaffords needed some well-deserved rest and decided to join some friends in Europe for a time. But before their departure, Horatio was detained on business. Anna and their four daughters were persuaded to sail off without him. But en route, the unthinkable tragedy struck. And the steamship they were traveling on was struck by another ship mid-ocean. And of the hundreds on board, Anna was only one of 27 who were rescued, having been kept afloat by a piece of debris from the ship. Their daughters, 11-year-old Anna, 9-year-old Maggie, 5-year-old Elizabeth, and 2-year-old Tanetta, all drowned leaving Horatio and his wife alone. While still in Chicago, Horatio received a tragic telegram from his wife that simply said, saved alone. The story of Horatio Spafford is one that shows us the storms of life at their worst. I can't think of anything more tragic than losing a child or a spouse. And there will be many in these times that ask the question, why? Where was God? Why would he do this? And there are indeed times when the storms of life are too great and God can seem very far away. And the question does arise, where is God in the storms of life? Are we alone? And so many throughout history, myself included, have asked this question. Now, as good Christians, we know that the word of God is sufficient. It is breathed out by God. So we go to the word to answer these questions. You join me in verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now, the events that had just happened before this passage of where we are this morning is Jesus had just performed an incredible miracle with five simple loaves and two fish fed over 5,000 people. And after this, he sends the people away. He needed time alone with his father. This is the introvert's favorite verse verse in the Bible. And Jesus often did this. And he sets for us a very good example. That when we face times in our lives where life is hard, nothing can give us more peace, more continuity, more security than getting on our knees and talking to our father. Commentator Matthew Henry says that No one is ever less alone than when they are alone with God. Prayer is a wonderful gift given to us by our God to come into closer conformity with him. So many today have a very skewed view of what prayer is, and they see God as this magical genie in the sky that if I just say the right things and push the right buttons and put in the right change, he's going to give me what I want. But what prayer is is direct communication with the creator of the cosmos with the intent of our wills coming into conformity with his. And through that process brings peace and security and a knowledge that our God is in control. Prayer is a wonderful gift, one that I know in my life is not utilized as much as it should be. But there is grace even in that. End of verse 23. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So, Jesus had finished praying and begins making his way toward his disciples. And 
What he sees is what should have been a routine lake crossing had turned into a very, very dangerous situation for the disciples. Now, keep in mind that at least, at least four of Christ's disciples were lifelong experienced fishermen. They understood how to deal with harsh weather and how to sail through that. It was their living. They were experienced in it. And the fact that they were struggling and making no headway shows the intensity of this storm. And all of their experience, all of their talent, all of their determination, all of their willpower to get themselves out of the storm that they were in failed them. The storm was beyond their ability to conquer. And they were floating, nearing death. An external source of strength was needed, one that they did not possess in that boat. Verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's somewhere between three and six in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea. So the disciples have been rowing all night, trying to make headway, trying to get to shore. And no progress have been made. I can, I can picture the scene of the, the wind blowing and the waves crashing against the boat and, and the rain pelting them in their face and the exhaustion, the aching arms, the aching back, strength leaving and the settling realization that they were going to die. And then it says that, it says that Christ came to them Walking on the sea. Now, so often, I think this part of this passage can be, can be overlooked as just a, well, of course he did. I mean, we had just seen Christ do countless miracles up to this point. Of course, it would just, it would just be natural that he could also walk on water. But this, this is an amazing, amazing event. Creation itself obeyed the command of its creator and the natural state of the water that was created altered the laws of physics the laws of nature that we are bound by as finite human beings do not apply to the one that created those laws and we see the supreme creator of the universe walking casually unhindered unafraid by his creation. And I truly believe that, and this is, this is the Josh Loftus commentary, those waves and that wind and that rain were showing off to their creator, praising him. Look at how you made us so perfect. And Christ is unhindered unafraid by the storm that is causing these disciples so much fear and dread. Verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So here we have the disciples fearing for their lives, rowing as hard as they can, and just when they thought nothing else could go wrong, right, one of the disciples yells to his, his brothers across the wind, hey, guys, let's look at the bright side. At least the lake isn't haunted, right? <laughs> it was probably Peter, let's be honest. <laughs> no. Just when they feel the dread of death reaching them, they look over and they see a figure walking toward them on the water. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a boat at night, whether it's on a lake or on the ocean, but your imagination can run away with you very quickly. Being on a boat at night is not a, uh, not a, not a pleasant experience for those that are not uh, well-versed in the art of boating, which I am not. And I can't imagine being on a boat at night during a storm that's trying to kill me, and looking over and seeing this thing walking toward me on the water. 
I guarantee you at that point they forgot all about the storm. And if it were me, I'd be thinking of taking my chances in the waves versus this thing coming toward me on the water. And just when all hope seemed lost, verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. With all the chaos that was occurring, Jesus' words slice through the wind to meet them at their distress. And it is a very short but profound three-part statement that I would like to focus on real quick. First, he says, take heart. It could also be translated, be brave or have courage. Have courage. Now, it would make no amount of sense to call someone to have courage if there was no object for them to put their courage into. All of their efforts have failed. Everything that they were used to putting courage in, their senses, their ability, their determination, the strength of their arms and their back had failed them. Yet this thing calls them to have courage. Have courage in what? Why? Jesus gives them the reason for their courage. In the second part, he says, it is I. It could also be translated, I am. The same self-identifying statement that Christ would make later in the Garden of Gethsemane. That would make the soldiers fall on their face. And the same self-identifying statement made to Moses through the burning bush. It is I. Christ has called them to have courage because it is I. And then he calls for the application of the theology that he had just given them. Do not be afraid. He has revealed himself to them. Now he calls for them to have the correct response. I have revealed myself to you in the storm. The correct response is to take heart and do not fear. Because it's him. Christ is the reason for the courage he is calling them to have. And just when the storm was at its worst, and the disciples had given up all hope, the dread of death over them like a fog, Jesus comes to them. Do you see the significance of that? That Jesus is the one that comes to them. Jesus is the one that reveals himself to them. We do not pull ourselves out of our situation, out of our storms, through the power of our own will. It requires Jesus Christ in our storm, to come to us and say, it is I, do not fear. So Christ has called. And Peter responds to the calls of this ghost on the water. Verse 28, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. So here's Peter, the headstrong one, the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. The one that always says what's on his mind. Now, from what I know of Peter and the description of his character that we have in Scripture and the personality that is given to us of Peter in the Bible, I believe this response of Peter could have been stemming from two, two, uh, two reasons. A couple of intentions. First one, I believe, could possibly be Peter's like, okay, we have this ghost on the water here. I'm probably going to die in the boat anyway. I'm going to call its bluff. If this is truly you, Lord, command me to come out. 
That's one option. The other, which I think is more probable and more in line with, I think, the relationship Peter and Christ had, is Peter knew, if this is truly the Lord, and the figure I am seeing on the waves right now is truly Jesus, I know for a fact the safest place for me to be on this lake, in this storm, is not in this boat, but it's with him, out on the waves. So he gets out, and he begins to do the impossible. He begins to walk on water, step after step, focusing on his master, eyes on Christ, as if on solid ground. And in my, in my mind, I, it's just the way that I think. I like, I like picturing this in scene of in, 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 uh, if, if this was going to be shot as a movie, right? I see the disciples so excited, high-fiving one another, looking at their friend walking on the water. He's doing it. Everything's going great. And the wonder of what they are seeing has, has overtaken the fear that they had in the storm. And everything was fine for a second. And all that changes in verse 30. But when he saw the waves, speaking of Peter, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they had gotten into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, we have a question that I think is important to ask, and that is a simple one. But it's, what, what happened? <laughs> Peter, you were doing so well. You were doing the impossible. What happened that caused you to start to sink? Why did you become afraid? Why did you doubt? Why were you overcome with such crippling fear? Why did you forget the reason for your courage? And the answer to that question, I believe, is very, very simple. He took his eyes off of Jesus. He took his eyes off of the source of his strength, the source of his power. He took his eyes off of his sufficiency. Peter took his eyes off of Christ and looked to his circumstances. He looked around him at the wind and the waves and the rain. And he forgot who was in control of all of them standing right in front of him. And church, the, the same is with us. Anytime we begin to fall into fear or dread, anxiety, depression, not wondering, excuse me, wondering what, what, what it's all about, wondering what we're going to do, every time we begin to look at our circumstances and look around us, at the wind and the rain and the waves in our own life crashing in, we will begin to sink. And we will sink hard because we have taken our eyes off of Jesus. Now, I want to point out something interesting here. And I think it's important. And that is that Jesus did not stop the storm immediately. He could have. 
He had it within his power to do so. But Jesus didn't stop the storm right away. Right when he showed up, things didn't just completely go away. And there are times in our lives as well, as Christians walking through this, these shadow lands, that the storm will not end even after we have put our faith in the sovereignty of God. There are times when we acknowledge the sovereignty of God in the situation and we remember our theology, God is sovereign. But the storm that we are in does not cease after that. Why? Why is that? Why does that happen? I believe because sometimes in the life of Christians, the storms of our lives must continue in order for our faith in Christ to be strengthened. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you. For what? My power is made perfect. Not in strength, not in ability, but weakness. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. And sometimes we as God's children need to be brought to the point to where we have nothing left so that Christ can fill us up. Understand this. We will never understand the immense power of Christ's sovereignty and supremacy until we understand our own immense inability and fragility. The power of Christ is made perfect in our weakness. And it's when we get to this point as Christians, where we have nothing left, that we can say with the Apostle Paul that therefore we will boast so much more gladly in our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. There's a story of a, uh, a uh, women's Bible study studying the book of Malachi uh, in the Old Testament. And they're studying chapter 3 when they came across verse 3, which says that he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. One of the women offered to find out uh, about the process of refining silver in order to kind of understand the context of this verse a little bit more. She said that she'd come back and report her findings to the group next week. So she finds a local silversmith and she asks if he can, she can uh, you know, hang out for the day and uh, check, out, check out the process. And as she watched the silversmith, she noticed that he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to, to, uh, to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames are hottest in order to burn away all the impurities. And the woman thought of you know, God holding us in such a hot spot, right, in order to burn off our, our own image and put on the image of Christ, right? And she thought about the verse again, and she said, and where it says that he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And she asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire with the silver the entire time it was refined. And the silversmith answered, oh, yes. And explained that not only did he have to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be damaged. She thought about this for a second, and then she asked him, well, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? And the silversmith smiled, and he answered her, oh, that's very, very easy, when I can see my face in it. Church, the application is this. God is never absent in your storms. He may be silent. But know this. Just as Jesus saw his disciples struggling in their boat, God sees you. 
He is never absent. And you can have courage because of who he is. And my question to you this morning is simple. Whether you are here and you are a Christian, you love Christ, or you are here and you don't know what any of this Jesus stuff is about, my answer to you, or excuse me, my question to you this morning is simple. Do you know the source of your courage? Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my Jesus? He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord above all lords. And this world, this stressful, messed up world, is but a footstool for his feet. And he is sovereign over all. And there is nothing, nothing more powerful than King Jesus. Do you know my Jesus? Allow me to tell you about him. He's, it's one of my favorite, favorite things to do. He created existence itself with a word, ex nihilo, out of nothing. And he holds existence itself together by the power of his sovereignty. And all political policies and historical events, past and future kings and presidents and dictators, wars and rumors of wars, death and life, the smallest speck of dust floating and sparkling in the sunlight to the planets in orbit around the sun. The crawling of an ant on the ground to the explosion of a volcano that rips the mountainside away. Marriages, relationships, good and bad. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Thoughts, dreams, desires, wants, needs, your circumstances, your storms, and time itself is held together and under subjection to the sovereignty of King Jesus. Do you know my Jesus? That's who he is. And what I just described to you does not even scratch the surface of his incredible majesty. He is the one walking with you on the waves. He is the one that calls you to have courage. Because you are his and he is yours. Do you know my Jesus? Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, says, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. In Jesus' own words at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, Behold, I am with you to the end of the age. To the end of time itself, our King Jesus stands supreme as the perfect mediator for us before the eyes of a holy God. And there is no storm too large, no trial too great, no waves too high that Jesus cannot reveal himself to you through them. Be your anchor in the storm and give you peace. Church family, if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you have nothing to fear. If you are here this morning and you do not have Christ, and you do not know of this, this peace that I am talking about, I would say to you gladly, friend, that today is the day of salvation. Repent of your sins. Throw away any self-sufficiency that you have any merit that you believe you bring to the table, 
any amount of strength or willpower that you believe you, you need to bring to the throne of God in order to be accepted. Throw it all away. It's rubbish. And cling to the righteousness of one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Lived the life that you should have lived. Died the death you were deserved. Three days later, rising from the dead, conquering sin, Satan, and death. And is now standing victorious as a ruling general and our conquering king in heaven. Repent and put your faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ. And this peace that passes all earthly understanding and comprehension will be yours through him. And those of us who have Christ and are living in this world with all its turmoil and pain and suffering, church, I call you this morning to boast even more gladly in your weakness. Boast in your storms so that the power of Christ might be shining through you to a world that is very dark. And know that in your storms, because of Jesus, you have nothing to fear. And when the anxiety hits, and the depression comes, and the doubt arises, when the loved one dies, when the finances aren't the way they should be, when the job is taken away or the job is stressful, whatever storm you find yourself in, know that you are safe in the arms of your loving Savior where you were from the beginning. And there is nothing that can take you out of the strong, sovereign arms of King Jesus. Nothing. It cost God too much to let you go. It cost him his son. And God will never rescind on a promise and a covenant that he makes with himself. Do you know my Jesus? After the news of his daughter's death, Horatio left immediately to bring his wife home. And on his journey to get his wife, he came to the place where the ship had sunk and he, his daughters were lost. And he looked into the watery grave and he did something that I believe is humanly impossible for a man suffering with such grief at that moment to do. He wrote a song. And the first stanza of that song says this. It says, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio trusted in his Savior walking with him in the storm. He knew that God had not abandoned him. And dear Christian, God will never abandon you. Let the peace of God run through you like a torrent. And know that even when the storm is fierce, and I know it can be, even when you have nothing left, even though there seems to be no end in sight, there is one that is with you in the storm that will reach down, pull you to himself, and say, take heart, little child. It is I. Do not be afraid. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat>